we have the distinct pleasure of learning more about the subject of curiosity. Let us quiet our minds, open our hearts, and welcome Todd Fink. Thank you so much, Sherry. It's a pleasure to connect with you again. Thanks for hosting us and our conversation today on this Father's Day. Uh, Sam and Lucy, thank you for the, for the beautiful musical offering. Kate, thank you. Beth, thank you. Rich, thank you. Mari, thank you for all the preparation and the assistance um, prior to this talk. I appreciate it. Joni as well. John, thank you. Maureen, where, wherever you may be, if you can hear me, I, I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, happy Father's Day to Will. And anybody else I may have forgot. And all of you, thank you, because you all make this possible. And it's been uh, such a such a joy for me to connect with you monthly and, and just share some reflections and learn from you. I'll, I'll begin by offering just a few words of appreciation for uh, my own father grow and, and how it connects to our topic today of curiosity and kindness. We lived in a number of places growing up but one thing uh, that I commend my dad and, and both my parents for is for giving us access to nature wherever we went, even if we were living in an apartment or when we lived with uh, my grandmother, it was across the street from a, from a forest preserve. Our last home of my childhood, I've lived many other places since my childhood, but the last home was in Freeport, Illinois, and it was a little house, but it was big to a little kid, but it was at the very end of town. There was no further to go before you were out in the, all the rural parts. So we could walk out the backyard and go to a quarry, to a forest, to a creek, to the Pecatonica River, um, and enjoy nature all the way 20 miles to Wisconsin. And nature just automatically inspires wonder, awe, and of course, curiosity. So I'm very grateful for that. And I, I wish a happy uh, day to him and to all the fathers. And even if you're not a parent, anybody who has exercised the energy of masculinity in a sacred manner or in a reverent manner for nurturing growth and balance and harmony, and protecting uh, community and loved ones and the vulnerable, I salute you. So curiosity, such a beautiful concept because it contains this word cure, the root word cure. How special is that? It, it means, um, at least on the surface, a genuine desire to know something, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper and explore the, the psychosocial implications of this quality of this trait or this potential value or virtue and how multifaceted it can be with its transformative power for, for society. The etymological origin is in this Latin word, curiositas. And again, this root sound, cur or cura, meant care or concern, or cure, or even choosiness. Um, so this is meaningful to me because curiosity can, can also be associated with just mere poking around or uh, nosiness or perpetuating gossip. So when we focus on this origin and this idea of concern and selectivity or or curation then we can re reconnect it with kindness and shift from mere distraction to the genuine wish to understand i was recently watching this um interview with oprah winfrey and dr bruce perry for for graduate school in social work and um they were talking about their book called What Happened to You. And it's about 
trauma. And Oprah was sharing about her school in South Africa and how she initially thought that just by providing great um, quality education, that it would present a pathway for these for the girls at the school coming from very adverse child, childhood experiences. The average number of aces for each student was six, I believe. But then she quickly learned that there, there needed to be more of a foundation before people could actually make good of uh, the educational opportunities. And so she connected with Dr. Bruce Perry and together they were talking about how a kind curiosity that allows a clinician, or in her case, an interviewer, or from Columbia Journalism School, from their standpoint, for, from the point of view of an interviewer, how to sit in the darkness and be able to sit with pain, thereby giving somebody else control over the process of telling their story. And this has long been particularly um, important for me and in my work when I'm at hospitals or doing substance use counseling. But this idea of what happened to you means I don't just want to know as a, as a healthcare provider, what's your complaint? What's the chief complaint or what's wrong with you? But what happened to you speaks to a desire to understand the uh, eco-biological cultural forces that have shaped your experiences and allow you to tell the story about what's behind what it's like for you, because the human condition is so multifaceted, so deep. But we could also think of this shift as curating the mind with curiosity, making it more like a fine art museum, which is mostly empty, except for uh, the display of one or two inimitable works. So it's elegant, that space. The emptiness allows for wisdom to, to fill, the, um, fill your heart, to fill your being. It has an important role in multiple spiritual traditions, wisdom traditions like Zen. Zen has a concept called beginner's mind. Beginner's mind means that over time, we lose some of the childlike imagination, curiosity, and wonder because a child is experiencing everything for the very first time. So any uh, plant or person is brand new or animal, and it inspires and it invokes a sense of wonder. But over time, as we get older, we start to have the sense that we've seen all this before. We've seen these people. We've seen these places. We've been been to multiple places and we get an idea of what things are like and our mind starts to become more abstract starts thinking about one year two year five year um planning preparing regret and it has its function planning preparing reminiscing and reflecting but we're not really wired for that we're wired to be engaged with our surroundings and it creates a lot of stress and it affects our health when we don't give ourselves permission to do that. So simple practice is to look at anything or anyone as if you're encountering them for the very first time. And, and then that brings you back into the spirit of openness and inquiry. In Hinduism, particularly Vedanta, which is the school of self-knowledge, there's a, a concept uh, called vichara, which is often preceded by atma, which means the self. Atma vichara is self-inquiry, trying to know oneself, or like Socrates said, know thyself. There's a special book in Vedanta called Yoga Vasishta, and it is a massive book, hundreds of pages with all kinds of fantastic stories, as they were taught by the sage Vasishta to his pupil, King Rama, or Lord Rama, who was an incarnation of Vishnu. But he still needed the, the wisdom communicated to him from his teacher. 
And something that always has resonated with me throughout my spiritual search are these four pillars of freedom in the beginning of the book that Vasishta imparts to Rama to really be free, spiritually seeking. He said, you, you need these four. Vichara, which is the investigation of what you are, self-control, which is some kind of discipline. Because if we're completely wayward or we don't curate the curiosity, um, it will dissipate all of your internal resources. Contentment, santosha in Sanskrit. Contentment, meaning if you can accept everything as it is, doesn't mean you like it, then um, a, a peace associated with wisdom can blossom within your heart, within the mind. And the last one is satsang. Satsang means associating with truth or with the wisdom of a sage. And if that's not possible, at least keeping the company of the sacred texts or the holy books, like the Vedas, the Upanishads. Um, and when I read that, I'm like, oh my gosh, like who can do all four of these things? But fortunately, after that, it's Vasishta saying, and if you can't do all four, at least do three. If you can't do all three, at least do two. And if you can't do two, at least do one. Any one of these even alone will, will take you to the, to the truth, to the goal. So even something like satsang. There are many examples of this in stories from different religions, like uh, Buddha's disciple Ananda, mostly just kept close company with the Buddha and, and tended to his needs and, and served him um, faithfully. And at the very end of Ananda's life, it was almost like a spontaneous nirvana. Um, in Sufism, the esoteric an esoteric branch of Islam, based on the migration of the Mughal Empire into India and the kind of cultural confluence of Vedanta and this Abrahamic tradition. But there is a concept called Marifa, which could be said to be um, a way of curiosity. It emphasizes divine longing. You can really feel this in the poetry of Rumi or Hafiz, this intense yearning for the beloved. And this seeking leads to God or gnosis of the divine. It's described in those mystical poems as a transformative and intimate relationship. Oftentimes you would think it's a, it's a romantic poem. But it's really about direct experience of the transcendent reality. Seeking knowledge and spiritual growth also takes the form of childlike wonder and appreciating the beauty of nature. So this is a theme in Sufism. But it's also an entry point overall for meditation and wisdom and enlightenment. Meditation is not a way of thinking. It's not... Um, trying to access a particular feeling, or even sitting with the desire to be peaceful. It is simply being interested in the present moment. It's awareness as opposed to thinking. And through that point of access, a person starts to get a sense of freedom from identification with any of the processes of the mind or nature. There is a paradox here, though. The paradox of curiosity lies in this contest between our innate desire to know things, but also our aversion to uncertainty. So again, I think the cure in curiosity can, can help us cultivate the sense of curation so that we can... Um, we can find out what really matters to be curious about. And therefore, it's worth bridging that tension or navigating those tensions of the aversion to uncertainty, which requires us to be able to be willing to enter 
into the unknown, like we were talking about last month with adventure. Curiosity does more for mitigating fear in the world than bravery does even. Once we get to know someone or something, um, a lot of the, the myths start to vanish, sort of like how Emerson said, when you go up to the big bully of the world and grab him fully or firmly by the beard, the aspirant is always surprised to find it comes off and it was only there to scare the timid travelers. Uh, let's delve into some of the cognitive and uh, psychological aspects of curiosity. There's a theory called information gap theory, which just posits that there is a space between what we know and what we want to know, and that leads to motivation. And that motivation um, involves dopaminergic pathways. Dopamine, neurochemical, is associated with attention and memory and the pleasure circuitry, which keeps us engaged in any kind of pursuit. When it's not working correctly, it leads to addiction and habitual patterns that become destructive and can lead to overdose or violation of values. But there is something pleasurable about having a sincere desire to learn something or to grow and to be able to access it or achieve it. There are five, uh, six, I guess, obstacles here for curiosity. One is fear. We talked about that briefly. The second one is rigid beliefs or dogma. If those beliefs are too rigid, it can close a person's mind and the truth could be right next to them, but they may miss it. Three, lack of time. It takes time to be able to in inquire. And so this really has something to do with power and privilege. We, we often think about wealth inequality, but we don't always acknowledge time inequality. Some research has shown that longevity isn't about having any particular secret or isn't about what we do. It's about what somebody doesn't have to do with work, with responsibility, with oppression. If a person can sleep enough, can have the time to eat enough, time to relate and connect enough, then you keep the threats at bay. Whereas somebody who's time poor may not be able to take care of those basic things. So we look at people, celebrities, and, and some of them, and people are like, oh, they look so young for their age. And it may really just be an example of time privilege. Um, fourth one is sensory overload in the digital age. We're bombarded with activity, with distractions, and it's hard to know what to, to truly be interested in. It's almost like we get curiosity fatigue and we have a meaning crisis because everything's coming at us saying, this matters, this matters, this matters. And it, it, ultimately we end up shutting down to to protect against this, sometimes we just have to step back. We have to step back. We have to turn things off. We have to unplug and go into a garden or in the forest and uh, give ourselves the, the space to be curious and curated once again. And then five norms or ex social expectations and pressures about what and, and taboos. So people often don't really talk about death and try to understand it, even though it's so serious and um, such an essential part of the human experience, but because it's uncomfortable or mysterious and how people die sometimes stirs up other uh, triggers that people tend to avoid this topic. And then six, over-reliance on authority. Um, so it's good to balance believing with seeking or with our own curiosity. And here's how it connects to kindness as I see it, um, or how we can cultivate kindness through curiosity. One, openness and empathy. 
I think it was Frank Zappo said, the mind is like a parachute. It only works when it's open. To seeking understanding, be curious, not judgmental, as Walt Whitman said. When we look into something we, and we really want to understand, this leads to kindness because it frees us from judgment. Sometimes judgment is just a habit that we have to see, acknowledge, and, and detach from. Third is the encouragement of dialogue and connection, which isn't supported in the media much and in society much. But for us, we can value engaging with other viewpoints. And four, genuine concern or altruistic concern for the well-being of others when you're being curious about something. This is how we can protect against... Um, gossip and nosiness or or intruding on somebody's privacy or respecting the privacy of of communities and especially marginalized communities so curious people are often kind together these four steps foster a symbiotic relationship between curiosity and kindness when someone is curious about a topic, they learn better. Research supports this. They exhibit heightened attention, increased focus, enhanced memory formation. Dopamine, I said, is part of memory formation. Structures like the hippocampus and the limbic system um, receive more ac activation, and they're involved with these processes. Curiosity also influences our perceptual pathways and supports our capacity to detect and process novel or unexpected stimuli more effectively. So simply put, when we scale this out to our psychosocial context, it reduces bias and deflates stereotypes. I'll conclude this part of the conversation, uh, the, the monologue into the dialogue with just a, a little note about a pre-Socratic philosopher of Greece named Parmenides, a little, little lesser known thinker. He lived in the 5th century BC, um, not, not Greece, southern part of Italy, actually. But his most famous work is called Peri Physios, which is loosely translated to On Nature. And it describes a journey of his through the universe, which was guided by a goddess. And the goddess reveals to Parmenides the, the nature of reality. From this poem, Parmenides argues that the universe is eternal and changeless. And that the change we perceive, the motions that we perceive, the multiplicity is all illusions, maybe something akin to a holographic world. When you look at the hologram, it looks like there's a building and there's a house and there's a car, but you touch it and your hand goes right through it because it's all one light, um, like a dream. All, where does all the multiplicity go when we wake up? And so he claimed that reality is this single, unified, indivisible entity that cannot be created or destroyed, just like we learned later in the conservation of energy. Parmenides' views of reality were based on this belief that the senses, our five senses, the way we empirically know the world. So Parmenides gave us the, this pr new perspective on epistemology, which means the study of ways of knowing. But he, th he thought that the senses are unreliable and that true knowledge can only be gained through curiosity, reason, and intuition. That these world of appearances can be deceptive. The way things look may not be the way they, things actually are. Or the way that we're told things are may not be the way they actually are. And that the true nature of reality can only be accessed, accessed through this process of investigation. The goddess explained to him that there are uh, two ways of understanding the world that we inhabit, that, that we are a part of, that we are an expression of, the way of truth 
and the way of opinion. And the way of truth involves curiosity, reason, and intuition, as I stated before, while the way of opinion is based solely on sense perception and therefore can be unreliable. So in conclusion, stay curious, my friends. I look forward to conversing more about this. And again, happy Father's Day.